Okay, today we're going to talk about uh, disaster on disaster, because that seems to be what's happening in the world. Just a little bit of a update, uh, schedule looking forward. Uh, probably next Sunday there'll be no prophecy update. Uh, Pam and I will be attending a, um, a wed family wedding and doing some traveling, and so uh, probably will not do one next week. I think it's the first week I will not have done a prophecy update in two and a half years. So I think uh, I'm entitled. And I do appreciate all of your uh, comments about my physical condition. Um, <laughs> the, uh, a number of years ago, a friend of mine was a very large man, about six foot eight or six foot nine, and I were playing golf in Palm Springs. And the ranger, the person that, you know, makes sure you're playing quick and quickly enough, came over to the people we were playing with. They were on the other side of the fairway, and he asked the question, by any chance are the two guys over in that other cart, meaning me and my friend, are they retired NFL football players? <laughs> now, I'm not sure, there's a couple ways of taking that. One is that they look like a couple of guys who've been crippled up by being hit too hard too many times. And they also have post-concussion syndrome and because they're not acting too brightly or too bright. But I took it to mean that I look like I used to be a professional athlete. That's how I <laughs> interpreted it. So uh, I have lost right around uh, since uh, around Thanksgiving 100 a little over 100 pounds. And uh, the, the one thing that I've noticed the most, uh, other than having to buy new belts and that type of thing, is that the other day I was playing golf, and my shoe got untied. And I bent over and tied it. You know, so that was a major, I don't think I've done that for a quarter of a century or more. My wife will attest to that. I used to have to put it up on, you know, on the card and then tie it to the side and so I actually bent over, left my foot on the ground, and tied my shoe. So it's a major accomplishment for me. I know you're like, I do that every day. What's the big deal? Well, I don't do it every day. I don't do even do it. I haven't done it this millennium. Uh, I know that. So uh, we talk about the convergence of events each week, and uh, I, I was a little bit behind this week because we were gone to Israel for a couple weeks, and traveling and that type of thing. So i a little bit late getting started this week, and I thought, well, you know, I got a lot. I'm going to be able to catch up. I'm going to do some things about Israel. And then things started happening yesterday, as you know, from London and other places. Um, and the president started tweeting and giving speeches, and that caused a major meltdown on the left. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. The disaster and disaster, that comes from Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 26. I'll read that in a moment. But Jesus said in Luke chapter 17 that there were indicators, there were patterns that had happened in the past that you could look for to determine what, what it would be like at the time of the coming of the Son of Man, the days of the Son of Man, when he would return the second time. Now, these things that are going to happen, and the scripture is full of many, 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 many of these things that are going to be happening, it's not going to be that one day they're not here, and the next day they're all here. There's going to be a buildup, and we've been talked about this for a long time, about the convergence, the acceleration, how there's almost like a vortex that happens, it gets very turbulent in the world, and look at Look at what's going on in the world right now. Everywhere you look, there's turbulence, there's disruption. At this point, I think we're past the tipping point where I don't think it changes before the Lord returns. I, I just don't see it. I, I don't know how anyone unwinds the mess. I believe that there will be someone come on the scene eventually that will say that they have all the answers but they'll be the biggest liar of all time. But people will fall in line and think because people don't like the disruption in their lives. And they, 
they are willfully blind and ignorant of what's going on around them. So one of the patterns that Jesus talked about in Luke chapter 17 was the days of Noah. It says in verse 26, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. There were plenty of signs in Noah's time that things were going to change dramatically. What signs were those? Well, one sign was that Noah preached about it. And another sign was, and you can see a a life-size replica of what some people think the art looked like just a couple hours down the road outside of Cincinnati at the Ark Encounter from the um, Creation Science Museum. And, and in Noah's time, he was building a big boat, an ark. And then what happened before everything fell apart? There were more signs, were there not? The animals all came two by two for the most part. Some came in groups of seven. And they all showed up to get on the ark. Do you not think that that should have been a sign to somebody that what Noah was saying might possibly be true. I'm building an ark so I can save my family and all of the animals that God will send here. And God sends all the animals there, and people are still around. But Jesus in Luke 17 says they were essentially willfully ignorant. They were marrying, giving in marriage. They didn't pay any attention to it. Another characteristic of that time was that uh, in Luke I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 6, verse 11, the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, he didn't destroy everything, but he destroyed the wicked people, because nobody... Repented. The only the only people that Noah was able to get onto the ark were his three sons and their wives, his wife and his son, eight of them. That's all that made it out of a world population at that time that could have probably. I mean, it's pretty easy with the the extra long lives that they had, lives that they had, and the number of children that they had. That it's possible. It's not beyond the realm of reason that the population of the earth at the time of the flood exceeded the top population of the earth today, which is now about 7 billion. And that's, people just don't think that way. They think it was, you know, Noah made it and the other 25 people that were around, they, they perished in the flood. But it could have been billions. And it's a picture, it's a pattern that we're to look for for what God is going to do. The people of Israel, just having gotten back from this and been able to go to some great archaeological sites, um, you learn a lot about the Bible when you walk in the land of the Bible. Samaria, Shechem, Shiloh, Ai, Bethel, Hebron, all of these uh, Mamre, all of these rich biblical historical sites. And you also learn a little bit about what went on with the people of Israel and their relationship to God and how it should instruct and inform us and our relationship with the God of the Bible. Because they worship the God of the Bible, well, sometimes not so well. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So in other words, you should study what happened in the Old Testament to understand what you should avoid. Where did they get into trouble? What, What caused them problems? Because God judged them over and over. And he sent people from 
nearby, sometimes sort of far away lands to judge those people. Now, God eventually would judge those people who were brought in to judge the Israelites. But the point is, God uses other people to judge different, and and this pattern continues throughout human history. So let's look at Ezekiel chapter 7. I'm going to read through the chapter. And um, Ezekiel prophesied before at the time of the Babylonian captivity. He was probably carried away in the first or second um, foray of the Babylonian Empire into Israel, probably in the second. And he wrote from Babylon, and he prophesied about the coming destruction of the southern kingdom of Judah, into which, by the way, a lot of people from the north had moved when the Assyrians invaded around 721 A.D. And I don't really have time to, I really would like to talk about that more today, but I might get to that a little bit at the end. But, so he's prophesied. Now we know in Ezekiel chapter 8, uh, he prophesies about what they're, or he, he looks at what they're doing in the temple. He sees what's going on in the temple in Jerusalem and the, air, and the environs around the temple and the idolatry and the wickedness and the false worship that's being engaged in by the leaders led by the leaders of Israel, the elders of Israel. So the chapter before that, this is what it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Also thou son of man, thus saith the Lord God unto the land of Israel, an end. The end is come upon the four corners of the land. Now is the end come upon thee, and I will send mine anger upon thee, and will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense thee all thine abominations." And mine eyes shall not spare thee, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense thy ways upon thee, and thine abomination shall be in the midst of thee, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, an evil, and only evil, behold, is come. An end is come, the end is come, it watches for thee, behold, it is come. I think I have this. Okay, verse 7. The morning has come upon, unto thee. O thou that dwellest in the land, the time is coming, the day of trouble is near, and not the sounding again of the mountains. Now will I surely pour out my fury upon thee, and accomplish my anger upon thee, and I will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense thee for all thine abominations. And mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. I will recompense thee according to thy ways, and thine abominations that are in the midst of thee, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Behold the day, behold it is come, the morning is gone forth, the rod hath blossomed, pride hath budded, violence has risen up into a rod of wickedness, none of them shall remain, nor of their multitude, nor any of theirs, neither shall there be wailing for them. You're beginning to get the point that judgment is coming. The time has come, the day draweth near, let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn, for wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. For the seller shall not return to that which is sold, although they were yet alive. For the vision is touching the whole multitude thereof, which shall not return, neither shall any strengthen himself in the iniquity of his life. They have blown the trumpet, even to make all ready, but none goeth to the battle. For my wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. The sword is without, and the pestilence, and the famine within. He that is in the field shall die with the sword, and he that is in the city, famine and pestilence, shall devour him. But they that escape of them shall escape, and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valleys, and all of them mourning, every one for his iniquity. And all hands shall be feeble, and all knees shall be weak as water. They shall also gird themselves with sackcloth, and horror shall cover them, and shame shall be upon all the faces, upon all faces, and baldness upon all their heads. (coughs) <coughs> they shall cast their silver in the streets and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They shall not satisfy their souls, neither their bowels, because it is the stumbling block. And I think I forgot the rest of that verse. Verse 20, as for the beauty of his ornament, he set it in majesty. But they made the images of their abominations of their detest- and of their detestable things therein, 
Therefore have I set it far from them, and I will give it into the hands of the strangers for a prey, and to the wicked of the earth for a spoil, and they shall pollute it. My face will I also turn from them, and they shall pollute my secret place. For the robbers shall enter into it and defile it. Make a chain, for the land is full of bloody crimes, and the city is full of violence. Wherefore, I will bring the worst of the heathen, and they shall possess their houses. I will also make the pomp of the strong to cease, and their holy places shall be defiled. Destruction cometh, and they shall seek peace, and there there shall be none. Mischief shall come upon mischief, and rumor shall be upon rumor. Then shall they seek a vision of the prophet, but the law shall perish from the priest and counsel from the ancients. And the New American Standard reads this way, when anguish comes, they will seek peace, but there will be none. Disaster will come upon disaster, and rumor will be added to rumor. Then they will seek a vision from a prophet, but the law will be lost from the priest and counsel from the elders. And then the chapter concludes, uh, the king shall mourn and the prince shall be clothed with desolation and the hands of the people shall be troubled. I will do unto them after their way and according to their deserts, I will judge them and they shall know that I am the Lord. They'll get their just deserts. It's, um, it's a very sobering passage. We'll talk a little bit more about this, a little bit more, I think, context of today and the events of the last 24 hours. But I just want to cover a few things uh, that are troubling. (laughs) They're indicative that we're at a point in human history where things are really changing dramatically. I saw a discussion yesterday with some people about this whole transgender thing. And the destructive impact that it has that people can't, they can't figure out what their gender is. And if we think that it's, it's a trivial matter, it's only a small number. I saw somebody who said that in a, in a long period of time, referrals for this issue in, in schools, and I'm, it, I don't know if it was a particular school district or schools, over a long period of time, they had 92 referrals for young people to talk to somebody about wrestling with this issue. And it is a real issue with some people. It's just what, for whatever reason, abuse or whatever, it is an issue. But over a, a long time, it was 92. In the last two years where this study took place, 2,106 referrals. Now, do you think that what's going on in the culture is having an impact? It's not one, you know, everybody's, oh, it's just 1%. It's not 1%, folks. It's a huge number. And when it happened before, the people who were referred for consultation on this, they were in their teens. Now, it's children, seven, six, five, four, even three-year-olds are being referred for this. I don't think Lot in Sodom had to deal with this. I don't know, but I'm just guessing that he didn't. This has disastrous social implications, apart from whether it's sin or anything like that, the impact it'll have on society. I mean, I see these pictures all the time, you know, of people with beards with pregnant bellies. They're transgender men or transgender women trying to become... It's weird. It's sick. It's, it's horrible. But it's happening everywhere. And if you don't accept it, you're intolerant, you're a bigot, you're a transgender phobe or a homophobe or whatever. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm kind of old school. It, 
it bothers me. I mean, it breaks my heart. But I, I also look down, what, what's it going to be like in 10 years, 20 years, 10, 5 years? You know, it was just two years ago this month that the Supreme Court essentially made same-sex marriage the law of the land. That was just two years ago. How far have we gone in two years? How far will we go in two more years? And here's something. I know, look, everybody said this was going to happen about health care and the cost of health care and that sort of thing. Watch. Insurance companies recommending assisted suicide for terminally ill patients. And here is a doctor interview. I chose to become a physician because I wanted to make a difference in people's lives. Recently, I had two different patients, and both needed life-saving procedures. When requesting a transfer to a center in their home states, one's in California, one's in Oregon, the insurance medical directors I spoke with said they would not cover the life-saving procedure that we'd requested. But hey, by the way, have you considered assisted suicide? You know, quite frankly, I was stunned. This is something we didn't talk about, we didn't request, we didn't ask for. As much as most insurance companies try to come across as your best friend, they want to do whatever the least costly thing is. It's a lot cheaper to grab a couple drugs and kill you than it is to provide you life-sustaining therapy. Simple as that. And everybody said <laughs> this was going to happen, right? Well, not everybody said. Um, Rahm Emanuel's brother, Ezekiel, what's his name, Ezekiel Emanuel? He should go read the book of Ezekiel, maybe. That would help him and actually believe that it's true. But he didn't, I was all on TV, oh, this isn't true. There's no death panels. It's just, it is. <laughs> I know in our personal insurance, we just switched to another company, but you know, whatever medications we had that were working for us would, as soon as we took them for a couple months, those were then put on a, band, a list that the insurance company wouldn't cover. The medication, and this just happened over and over again with a number of different medications that we've used. So it's coming. At North Point Community Church, uh, Andy Stanley's church, they just finished a sermon series called Pack Your Bags about transitions. Now, a uh, show of hands, how many of you think that that's about getting ready for end times and Bible prophecy? Nobody? It's not. It's just about getting ready to go, you know, going from one grade to the next, or starting school, or starting a new transition in your life. Why should we be, this is a, from May, about a month, uh, three weeks ago, New Gallup poll, fewer than one in four Americans believe the Bible is the actual word of God and is to be taken literally word for word. So when we see all this happening, should we be surprised? There really is a solution to all of this. Um, and so that's why I think when I see statistics like this, it's going to happen. I, you know, I think I know people, they say the Bible, they want to get on a forum, a public secular forum on a Facebook uh, group, and say, well, the Bible says, and watch what happens. <laughs> What's going to happen? You're mocked. You're unfriended, and then the ultimate insult uh, put down in the world of Facebook is you're blocked because you believe the Bible or you're a person of faith. I see it all the time. Even in Christian groups, somebody will sneak in and say, you know, you're all crazy and nuts. So the next one, this is, this is actually a fake quote, but Abraham Lincoln said, the road to hell is paved with the intentions of social justice warriors. Now, he didn't really say that, 
But I would like to think that if he was around today and he saw the nonsense going on in the social justice warrior movement, he would have said something like this. I mean, look at things like Evergreen State. I don't even have time. I don't even have time to give you a small sampling of the clips that I come across each week. Like, have you seen this at Evergreen State uh, University in Washington? I think it's near Olympia, Washington. Uh, a white professor refused to participate in the Black Lives Matter or whatever group had sponsored uh, a day of absence. You're supposed to be absent to show solidarity with us because of the way we're oppressed. We're running a university now. We've taken it over, but we're oppressed people. And he, the, can't, the president of the university, first of all, they should shut down the university. Have a, shut it down like they had to used to have bank holidays back at the time of the Depression. Shut these places down. Or stop all federal loan assistance to students that are going there. It's just because it's tearing apart the fabric of society. And even though this man was cornered and threatened with violence, the police wouldn't come because the university president told the campus police not to get involved. And he capitulated to all of their demands. In, in Hot Air, a blog that I read, I have a dream, he says. I dream that one fine day I will come across the news item based on the latest complaint from the social justice warriors over this or that bit of evil perpetrated by the white heteronormative patriarchy, which is, so, which is simply so outrageous that we will have reached peak so, SJW. In other words, we've reached the limit where we're going to put up with this nonsense. Once that happens, we can all hang up our running shoes and go home to reflect on how things got this far into the twilight zone. Sadly, we have not clearly reached that point yet because each week brings yet another round of insanity to top the last. Example, last week in Portland, Oregon, a couple ladies, they went to Mexico, and they saw they liked the food. So they asked the person, how do you make that burrito? That's fantastic, that tortilla for the burrito, it's phenomenal. So they found out, they came back, they opened up a food truck, which became very popular in Portland, Oregon, until people in the Portland news and blogging community started saying that they had engaged in cultural appropriation. They had stolen the culture of Mexico to make money and exploit it to make money off of it. And they're out of business now. Cultural appropriation. And, you know, the interesting thing is, um, didn't McDonald's own Chipotle for a while? Or still does? I think it's, they spun it off, maybe. Did anybody go complain at Chipotle for cultural appropriation? You know, long lines to get a burrito with way too much rice on it. I mean, you know, that's cultural appropriation. That should be stamped out. This is where it's going. This is just, even in the, in the um, Washington Post, the, where this opinion piece appeared, cultural appropriation is a problem, and this guy to burrito cart is not part of it. But the burrito cart, the burrito food truck, is now out of business. Then we have this ridiculous example. Linda Sarsour, a hater of Israel of the first rank, a supporter of terrorist groups, is invited to give the uh, City University of New York graduation speech for one of their schools. Here's what it says. She says, we in this room together must commit to never being bystanders to poverty, lack of jobs, and health care. In the age of alternative facts, fake news, and emboldened racism and xenophobia, we cannot be silent. We cannot allow the voices of hate and divisiveness to be louder than the voices of solidarity and love. This is called projection. This is where you project your worst characteristics and weaknesses onto somebody else. And she's, this lady is everywhere, promoting Sharia law, running down people that oppose the imposition of Sharia law in very stark terms. And she spent a lot of, she's been busy lately deleting all the tweets that she made over the years 
But people have them. She's a liar. This is uh, Harvard University this week. What is it? It is a separate graduation ceremony for black students. No whites allowed. And what everybody says is this is the trend of what's going to be in the future. More little dividing into groups. So I guess any of the, what is it, 47, 63, 54 types of genders will all, I guess, have their own graduation ceremony so they feel validated. Poor babies. You're going to Harvard and you feel oppressed. It costs, what, I don't know what it costs. I talked to somebody, trying, it was some university, it wasn't like an Ivy League school. I said, what's that run? She said, oh, this is Notre Dame. Her daughter wanted to go to Notre Dame. How much does that cost? It was either sixty-five or $70,000 per year. They'll, they'll give you assistance, so it only cost you $35,000 per year. Remember the days when we were in school, you know, my wife and I? You could make enough money in the summer to pretty much pay your tuition room and board for the next year. Not anymore. <laughs> um, okay. I, this is just um, celebrations of diversity in, di in distinct ceremonies. And it, it just says it's going to increase. And so this happens at Harvard, and nobody... So, now, if they had a whites-only, Caucasian-only ceremony, what would happen? All hell would break loose. This happened. Hackers cripple British Airways. UK threat levels severe. This was a few... I, you know, it seems like this happened two weeks ago. It was just like early in the week. They shut down British Airways for a day. Thousands of thousands of flights. The two big airports around London shut down. And they said the UK threat level was severe, because why? Well, they had the uh, Westminster attack recently. They had the Manchester attack just, what, two weeks ago? Three weeks ago? And now we know what happened yesterday. Now, they think that North Korea may have been behind this. And here's George Friedman talking about the threat of North Korea. Now, we did have a successful missile test. But you need to understand that they have satellites that come from a way that we're completely blind. And there's belief that they may have you know, nuclear EMP things on those satellites. But here's George Friedman talking about, because I mean, this week, how many people talked about North Korea? We talked about the successful missile test, but George gave a speech about a week ago at a conference in DC, and this is what he said. What we're looking at is the indicators. A second carrier battle group has joined the Vincent. Uh, off Korea. There's some indication the third one is moving to join it. F-35s, our most advanced fighters, have deployed to Korea. You have an exercise going on with over 100 F-16s in the skies over South Korea. And most ominous, if you will, civil defense briefings are taking place in Guam. And Guam is where our B-52s, B-2s, and B-1s are based, and that would be the main axis of attack. So if we're not going to war, we're doing a really good imitation. The civil defense briefings, what does that entail? What does that mean? In a war, you never know what the other side is going to do. And we know that the South Koreans are acting, the North Koreans are acting cocky for reasons that I don't fully understand. Let's assume for the moment that our intelligence is not quite right and to have a long-range missile. Let's assume that they might attack a assault from the sea. Any number of things might be the case, terrorism. You've got a civilian population on Guam, and remember Guam is part of the United States. Uh, we have a civilian population, they have to be protected. So most of them wouldn't know what to do in the event of an attack. I'm not clear that after the briefing <laughs> they wouldn't know what to do, but at least you're going to make sure that to the extent they're ready. And when you start getting the civilian population ready, uh, you've sort of made a decision 
because that is going to panic a lot of people, and there's no reason to panic them for no reason. Well, I'll talk about this in a minute. Uh, this was The Economist a couple weeks ago. Why Israel needs a Palestinian state. You'd say they have a really good view of things there. This is something you don't even hear about. Congo, one of the larger countries in Central Africa, it's even the economist is calling it a tinderbox. What's going to happen there? I mean, they've had clash after clash after clash there. Millions have died. It's not resolved. Central African Republic next door is still a problem. I mean, everywhere you look in the world, there are these problems. Venezuela, we never even talk about that. Total meltdown. Total meltdown. And so what does uh, a lot of people on the left in this country want? We want to be like Venezuela. It's a level of insanity that I don't think we've seen. So last night, this happened in London. Three guys drove in an S across the London Bridge. People were jumping off. There's people, there's at least one girl I read this morning missing. At least seven dead, 48 in the hospital. The three attackers have been shot, were shot and killed about eight minutes after it started. People were running down. They went through a, bur a place called the Borough Market. Uh, they ran over people and got out of the car and went and slit their throats with like a 12 inch knife. It helps put it in context, like when we were stuck at that checkpoint coming out of Nablus in Israel a couple weeks ago. Israeli soldiers have been stabbed at that checkpoint. Now you know why they're a little bit nervous. Because these people caused a lot of havoc. And the headlines all over the place, six die, carnage across London as terrorists strike again. Tonight they're supposed to have a benefit concert at um, Manchester to remember the victims of the terrorist attack a couple weeks ago. Um, please don't bring any bags, they said. Because you know, bringing bags will make other people a little bit uncomfortable. So a lot uncomfortable, it should be. Uh, I don't, you know, what's the answer? <laughs> well, I can tell you what's not the answer. You'll see that in a moment. Uh, just all these, all these pictures coming out about what happened in, in London. And this, they shouted, this is for Allah, as they stabbed indiscriminately. Attacks out of the blue trigger panic in the capital. Out of the blue? I mean, the headline on Drudge a few days ago was UK threat level increased. I guess they don't believe their own threat levels or something. Here's a good graphic from, I think this is the Daily Mail sort of showing how it unfolded. That's the London Bridge. Uh, the borough market there to the left in the center. Uh, there's a cathedral there. I saw the priest from that cathedral interviewed, and he said, I mean, what do you think they, they all say? Uh, it's not about Islam, right? That's the first thing out of their mouths. Uh, this was the headline, I think, in the Daily Mail today, the jihadi in an arsenal shirt. I think that's a soccer team in London. This was posted on an ISIS website at the, at the left, they said, this is how you do a terror attack. Use whatever you can, gun, knife, and truck. I was just posted the other day. And down here it says, See, do your jihad, and a picture of a car running somebody over. So this is what the Islamists want. After the Manchester attack, they solved the problem. A local imam gave a copy of the Quran to the, local, to the police chief in Manchester. Donald Trump tweeted about it. And look, sometimes I criticize him. Okay, this time I think I agree with him. <laughs> he said, we need to be smart, vigilant, and tough. We need the courts to give us back our rights. We need the travel ban as an extra level of safety. Riza Aslan, who is a commentator, reporter at CNN, he was a guy who went to India and in some ceremony ate a human, eight human brains as part of the ceremony. He's still employed by CNN. So Kathy Griffith, I mean, she's a little bit, I shouldn't have mentioned her, I was not going to mention her, but no pictures. 
you know, she can hand hold up a severed fake severed head of the president, and then turn around and have a news conference where she and her lawyer, her lawyer rails about Trump removing himself from the, us from the Paris Accord, and Kathy Griffith gets up and says, "I'm being bullied by the Trump family. They broke me." That was all. That is all fake, planned in advance nonsense by her. The news, she had the news conference lined up a long time before she ever, th that was all part of a series of events that she was going to have. She is as, well, as fake as, so here's Reza Aslan's response to Donald Trump's tweet. This piece of blank is not just an embarrassment to America and a stain on the presidency, he's an embarrassment to humankind. So he wants to stop terror attacks. He is a piece of bloop and an embarrassment to humankind. This guy's still employed today by CNN. CNN is evil, dark, dirty, immoral, whatever adjective you want to put on it. They're good for clips, for stuff like this. Here's one, CNN liar. I think that's true. And in this Supreme Court is taking the travel ban under consideration. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, actually, in, in England, uh, who, there's an election this Thursday. They suspended the campaign for today. The election is Thursday. And everybody thinks the Tories are going to win, right? Big time against the left. Now, this is one poll that I saw, which shows a pretty big difference, you know, at least 10 points. But I saw another poll on Reuters, which said the, the difference between the party of Theresa May and the, the Labor Party, the socialist leftist of Jeremy Corbyn, was under 1% now in the polls. Theresa May could lose. What does that mean? Jeremy Corbyn's in charge, Labor's in charge of Parliament, and he says Hamas should be taken off the United Kingdom's terror list. It's, it's, um, words fail me. Words fail me to describe this lunacy. Here was Theresa May this morning. This is a several minute clip. Last night, our country fell victim to a brutal terrorist attack once again. We cannot and must not pretend that things can continue as they are. Things need to change, and they need to change in four important ways. First, while the recent attacks are not connected by common networks, they are connected in one important sense. They are bound together by the single evil ideology of Islamist extremism that preaches hatred, sows division, and promotes sectarianism. It is an ideology that claims our Western values of freedom, democracy, and human rights are incompatible with the religion of Islam. It is an ideology that is a perversion of Islam and a perversion of the truth. Defeating this Okay, I have one question for her, Prime Minister May. How many attacks done in the name of that religion have to occur on your soil, in, in your neighborhood, before you recognize what the ideology is? You know the old definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result? This is insanity, she continues ideology is one of the great challenges of our time but it's it cannot impossible. be defeated through military Prime intervention Minister alone it will not be defeated through the maintenance of a permanent defensive counter-terrorism operation however skillful its leaders and practitioners it will only be defeated when we turn people's minds away from this violence and make them understand that our values pluralistic British values are superior to anything offered by the preachers and supporters of hate. Second, we cannot allow this ideology. 
Now, uh, when Pam and I were in Shechem, Nablus, we went up to the top of Mount Gerizim, and we could look down on the city of Nablus, could see the Palestinian refugee camp that's been there for 70 years. In the Palestinian, but in, in a place was controlled by Jordan, <laughs> and then under the control of the Palestinians today, and they still have their refugee camp. It's the one thing you can inherit in that area, I guess, is refugee status. And we could hear, it was Friday morning, and you could hear the loudspeakers up on top of the mountain, and they weren't preaching a message of, from the mosque, they weren't preaching a message of tolerance and love. You could tell, I mean, I don't speak Arabic, but you can kind of tell when somebody's not speaking a message of love. And she, she has no answer for this. ...the safe space it needs to breed. Yet that is precisely what the internet and the big companies that provide internet-based services provide. We need to work with allied democratic governments to reach international agreements that regulate cyberspace to prevent the spread of extremist and terrorism planning. And we need to do everything we can at home to reduce the risks of extremism online. Now, what do you think is going to get banned? Uh, church websites, that type of thing. You know what's going to happen with this. Third, while we need to deprive the extremists of their safe spaces online, we must not forget about the safe spaces that continue to exist in the real world. Yes, that means taking military action to destroy ISIS in Iraq and Syria, but it also means taking action here at home. While we have made significant progress in recent years, there is, to be frank, far too much tolerance of extremism in our country. So we need to become far more robust in identifying it and stamping it out across the public sector and across society. That will require some difficult and often embarrassing conversations. But the whole of our country needs to come together to take on this extremism. And we need to live our lives not in a series of separated, segregated communities, but as one truly united kingdom. Fourth, we have a robust counter-terrorism strategy that has proved successful over many years. But as the nature of the threat we face becomes more complex, more fragmented, more hidden, especially online, the strategy needs to keep up. And she, they're flailing. They don't know what to do. Okay. Uh, now, whether you like her or not, Katie Hopkins was on Fox this morning. I was able to catch just the last part of it. She's a commentator on the news, and um, I think Mark Stein was wonderful this morning. You can look that up at the Fox thing. Here was Katie Hopkins. Of ones checking they're safe. I've had texts from my parents asking me to stay out of London today. I've had texts from my own children asking when I'll be home. And I've also had conversations from a lot of people talking with their partners about how they get out of London, how they will not come near London. So contrary to the messaging that this is a safe city, a safe country, that is not how people here feel. They fear for their lives. They fear for their children's lives. And we have to step up and we need to start incarcerating, deporting, reporting, repeating, until we clean this country up. So that's what, I mean, you talk about the nuts and bolts of this. Nigel Farage on the show a short time ago, bringing up the word internment, bringing up the specter here in the United States mm -hmm. of internment camps, Japanese internment camps. You're mentioning deportation and rounding up and mass incarceration. How, what would that look like? I mean, do you think that Theresa May, mm -hmm. do, you think that the, do you think that the British government would actually do that? I don't think they've got the stomach to do that. I don't think they've got the political will to do that. I also see how they pander still relentlessly to these preachers who are on the wrong side of this argument, people who are against the prevent strategy for counterterrorism. people like Cage, who speak out always in defense of Islam and how great it is, uh, kind of Islamic preachers who speak out about the fact that what we need to be worried about is Islamophobia. We're not worried about that. We do need 
these internment camps before, I would have bought the idea that, no, this gets more people radicalised, you know, that's not the solution. But we've gone beyond the tipping point. I tell you, this country cannot take another attack. What we actually needed to hear from Theresa May today when she walked out of number 10 was never again. That's the words we need to hear to have faith in this country, because I tell you, looking at my email, even liberal left uh, individuals are emailing me to say, I can't tell my friends, but we have got this chronically well, wrong. Well, I don't know what we're going to do about this country. Well, it's a really upsetting state of affairs. President Trump tweeted his support for the British people this morning. Certainly, we stand with you as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your commentary this morning. Katie, Katie, now, so let's move on to something else, which just kind of didn't make the news much this week, which is the issue of global warming. Uh, there's a partisan this survey from Financial Times shows that there's a divide politically over global warming. I, look, I, I don't think it's happening that much. If it is, it's insignificant. Even when this Paris Agreement to, came out, everybody said, it, if everything, everybody did everything, it would result in maybe over time uh, two-tenths of a degree less increase in temperature over several decades. If everybody did anything and spent billions and billions and billions of dollars and people were employed and all kinds of social costs, it, it, a lot of people said, the Paris thing was pretty much a fraud from the beginning, even people on the left. It didn't go far enough. So Trump came out, he gave a speech this week, and the reaction has been, I'm going to look at some of the reactions, because I think this is indicative of, of a society that's completely lost its mind, or cultures that have lost their minds. Uh, New York Daily News, Trump uh, Times, Trump abandoning global climate accord, Daily News, Trump to world. Drop dead. Remember, he said something about, I represent the people of Pittsburgh, not Paris. So what hat was the response to that? The mayor of Pittsburgh came out and said, well, you don't rep you're not my guy. And so now all these communities say, well, we're going to do it anyway. And all these corporations, corporations say, we're going to do it anyway. Uh, by the way, my mother grew up in Pittsburgh. This is a picture taken midday in Pittsburgh in 1943 when she was graduating from high school. It was like that every day. So it's a pretty nice place now, and I'm not advocating, nobody's advocating that we go back to that. But there are real costs to that. There used to be a lot of people working in those steel mills. I went to high school in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. We had a string of mills through Johnstown that went, I don't know, 10 miles? maybe 12 miles, continuous length of steel mills. I worked there one summer. It wasn't, it wasn't like that, that, because things have been changed. But look at the reactions that people had. Here's one uh, newspaper, Trump. This is from the Daily News. Let planet burn up. Immoral assault on public health. Big chunk of Antarctica ice about to split. Uh, even a former politician got involved in the act. No clips. No clips. I believe the United States should be at the front of the pack, he said. But even in the absence of American leadership, even as this administration joins a small handful of nations to reject the future, I'm confident that our state cities and businesses will step up and do even more to lead the way and help protect for future gen generations the one planet we've got, and I'm pretty sure... The subtext of that is, go to my website, Organizing for Action, and we'll show you how all to get, all to get involved and oppose this guy. In Europe, you know, his guys are meeting with Erdogan, and now his, he's coming back from the ashes, even in Europe. I think that's prophetically significant. And in, in Israel, there's a report now that he's trying to take over the control of the Temple Mount from Jordan. Well, Erdogan of Turkey is trying to do that. This is prophetically significant. It's one of the nations identified in Ezekiel chapter 38. 
uh, even, you know, this graphic kind of shows that um, U.S. carbon emissions are projected to fall over the next decade. Everybody, these are editorials from uh, papers in England about Trump and Putin, and it just, it's crazy. There was another um, statement issued by another former politician in the prior administration, and he said in 2015, because of American leadership, nearly 200 countries came together around a science-based agreement to grapple with a global threat. For a president to follow that historic step forward by unilaterally walking backwards from science and backwards from leadership on behalf of polluters and fringe ideologues may be the most self-defeating action in American history. Well, I have two more that were more self-defeating. Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State and you as Secretary of State, John Kerry. Those were more defeating. This tweet from Donald Tusk, President of the EU. Today we step up climate cooperation with China. Big mistake of the U.S. to leave Paris Agreement, but fight continues with or without the U.S. Tom Steyer, a billionaire, said this, if Trump pulls the U.S. out of the Paris Agreement, he will be committing a traitorous act of war against the American people. Ben Rhodes, you remember him? He's the fiction writer who was the policy guy behind the Iranian agree Iran agreement. Leaving Paris is not a win for anyone. There's something wrong with the society in which there's a rose garden celebration for such a thing. Here's a couple clips from uh, NBC folks. Where our future lies in climate and other things. Just an extraordinary moment. Well, it's a momentous moment and a very ominous moment. Uh, because depending on how far President Trump can go and how effective he may be the rest of the way, uh, this can make the United States second tier in terms of world leadership, at least on this subject. But I do think, uh, Lawrence, that there's something else at work here with President Trump. And uh, William Marshall wrote some of this on the Internet today. And that is, from the outside looking in, it seems clear that he's mad. Uh, he has some rage. He's scared. The what did he do with Russia narrative is closing in on him. Still, the investigation is about his tax returns, which is a lot of closing in on him. He just came back from this European trip, and he was angry with the leader of Germany, Ms. Merkel, and the new leader of France. So what you have here is a president who's lashing out uh, in anger. We haven't had a president this psychologically troubled. I'm, I'm trying to use my language very carefully. We haven't had a president this psychologically troubled in this way since at least Richard Nixon. Yes. Uh, and remember, we're still very early in the Trump presidency. Yeah. Okay, here's Fareed Zakaria on CNN, and I don't know if this clip's going to be too loud or too soft, so. Um, Jake, I think that it really will, if it proves to be what we think it is, this will be the day that the United States resigned as the leader of the free world. Uh, it's, it's nothing short of that. The, the, irris the irresponsibility of this act is breathtaking because the Paris Climate Accords are actually extraordinarily flexible. They do not dilute American sovereignty. They allow every country to make its own plans. Uh, that's why countries that have jealously guarded their sovereignty, like China, like India, like Russia, have all signed on. In other words, Paris isn't that big a deal anyway, so that's a big deal when you don't do the thing that's not a big deal. I, I'm telling you, there is... It, look, I want to be optimistic, but I think we're past the tip. I've mentioned this earlier. We're past the tipping point. It's here's uh, Lurch again. Donald Trump won, so he is not helping the forgotten American. He is hurting them. Their kids will have worse asthma in the summer. They will have a harder time having economic growth. Uh, he's made us an environmental pariah in the world. And I think it is uh, one of the most self-destructive moves I've ever seen by any president in my lifetime. And he had a close-up view of one. Okay, and here's uh, serial liar Brian Williams. 
On a sunny day in the Rose Garden, what could be defined and construed as a dark speech, and as you go through it, more like four or five uh, dark speeches uh, in there. I couldn't help but notice uh, Matthew Miller uh, of, of the Obama Justice Department just said on social media, this is like watching a Hugo Chavez speech, long, rambling, veering from topic to topic, prattling on about exploitation by foreigners. Um, yes, a partisan view. Yeah, a little partisan view there. But here's the man that has the answers. Very unusual for the leader of this country to be speaking in English. I think this is very significant. Gabriel Macron. Today, Emmanuel Macron. The President of the United States, Donald Trump, announced his decision to withdraw the United States from the Paris Agreement. I do respect this decision. But I do think it is an actual mistake both for the U.S. and for our planet. Tonight, I wish to tell the United States, France believes in you. The world believes in you. I know that you are a great nation. I know your history, our common history. To all scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs, Responsible citizens who were disappointed by the decision of the President of the United States, I want to say that they will find in France a second homeland. I call on them, come and work here with us, to work together on concrete solutions for our climate, our environment. I can assure you, France will not give up the fight. I call on you to remain confident. We will succeed because we are fully committed. Because wherever we live, whoever we are, we all share the same responsibility. Make our planet great again. <laughs> Thank you. You know, if I wrote this, if I made this up, you would, you would tell me I was crazy. That uh, you need to watch this guy. Um, even the French, I don't have, really have time to get into it. Um, there's no sound on this video. I'll talk about it for a minute. The White House put this up. The Paris Accord is a bad deal. And then the French put up leaving is a bad deal and why it undermines. And this is the French foreign ministry did this in response to the president of the United States. Uh, there were a bunch of other ridiculous responses, but probably the biggest one was um, from the Financial Review out of Australia, which was this graphic that they put up about what Trump was doing to the world. Um, I didn't mention this last week, uh, but Zbigniew Brzezinski had passed away. Uh, he's a, I think he did a lot of evil in this world. And um, so he's a globalist, New World Order type uh, and if you, as we always say, the question around here is, how do you spell Zbigniew Brzezinski? And the answer is, just like it sounds, right? So uh, here were other things. Then Trump had just come back from Europe. I mean, the reactions to him there, even um, the man boy uh, Trudeau thing, this guy from Canada, he's deeply disappointed in what Donald Trump said, and I'm sure that that will ruin the rest of your afternoons. <laughs> Angela Merkel, Europe cannot rely on U.S. and faces life without the U.K., and that's okay. Uh, let me just see if I... Um, this is from the Jerusalem Post about a week ago when we were in, in Jerusalem for Jerusalem Day. The headlines that happened during the Six-Day War in 1967 
a lot of people are remembering that over the last couple of days, the biggest one of which was Israel taking back the Temple Mount, but then Moshe Diane giving it back. There is a conference coming up, and it, it, this is Palestine Expo 2017. Now, one of the speakers there, there's a, you can look it up online, is Michael Pled, P-L-E-D. He is the son of an Israeli general who was involved in some of the great battles that led to the formation of the modern state of Israel. He is a leftist. I didn't have time to dig out. He spoke at a thing called Friends of Sabeel North America, F-O-S-N-A. You can find uh, Sabeel. It's a pro-Palestinian organization. He wears the, that scarf. Uh, when he speaks, and he's virulently anti-Israel, and he'll be speaking at this conference along with a bunch of other anti-Israel piece. But look at where it's located. You probably can't see it. Palestine Expo 2017, Queen Elizabeth II Center, Westminster, London. Was Westminster in the news a couple months ago or a month or so ago? Yeah terrorist attack a couple months ago. So they, they learned their lesson in England, didn't they? Um, John Bolton says, two-state solution, not viable anywhere. Uh, I'll have to do this more at a future update because we're over time and people have to tear down. So um, crazy world. And I have a whole bunch of stuff on Israel. Um, I will be on the Hagman show, Hagman Hagman Report, or Hagman Report, on Tuesday night. I think it's 7 o'clock. So if you want to tune in and listen to it, I think I'm on the first hour from 7 to 8. And I'll talk a little bit about the trip to Israel and some of the things there. They usually give you pretty free reign. And unless something else comes, I mean, nothing's going to happen in the meantime, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> And so we'll talk a little bit about um, the modern state of Israel. Look, one thing that became apparent to me when we were in Israel, though, was that this is the battle. And I'm looking for my slide. When we were there, we went to Samaria. And in Samaria, I think I have a slide on that. The Assyrians attacked Samaria and the invasion to take over the northern kingdom of Israel. And they came in and they destroyed like 46 cities. They went against Judah also. Um, this is the area of the Tel at Samaria, which was Ahab's palace. Remember Ahab had a wife named Jezebel? A couple of years ago, I don't know when it was, they found the tomb of Ahab and Omri there. Because only kings are buried in the palace. So when you go to Jerusalem in the city of David, which is down below the old, the, what we now call the old city, the original city of David, they found nine tombs in the royal palace of David at Jerusalem. Now, they don't talk about it a lot, but they're pretty sure they found the tomb of King David there. Why? Because kings are only buried in the palace. Proof of that is up the road a ways in Samaria, and this city, because of its fortifications, and it's located on a pretty steep high hill, it withstood the assault of the Syria, uh, Assyrians for three years. But what happened, and this is the uh, Augustus Palace that was built by Herod there, or the Augustus Temple, built by Herod there, emperor worship starting at the time of Christ, kind of significant. Um, What you learn, though, when you read, you can read this about this in 2 Kings 18, 2 Kings 19. The Assyrians went against Jerusalem to destroy Jerusalem. Why? Because everybody fled to Jerusalem. It was like a sheepfold. They doubled the size of the city to contain all the people that had fled there as refugees. And Sennacherib, 
wanted to destroy Jerusalem. Why? Well, it was a satanic plot. <laughs> if you destroy Jerusalem, what do you destroy? The Messiah, <laughs> the kingly line of David, all this stuff, the temple. And you remember the story of Sennacherib? And Hezekiah saw the vision of the angels. And the angel of the Lord came and destroyed, in one night, 185,000 Assyrians. And they just sort of, it sort of says in Second Kings, and they got rid of the bodies. Significant battle. The, the prophetic part of that is that Jerusalem remains the epicenter of where this final conflict is going to take place. And I'll try to talk about that more in, in coming weeks because we're just we're flat out of time. But the reason is found in Zechariah 8, where the Lord says, I am jealous for Zion. Now, when God says he's jealous for something, he means it. And so this is where the final epics of epic of human history is going to unfold there around Jerusalem. Um, you see pictures of this, what happened in the past is going to have in the future. That's why the Bible says these things happened to them, for example, so that we wouldn't fall into the same traps that they did. So we'll talk more about this. It's a, um, there's really a lot to say and, and not enough time today to do it. So probably no prophecy update. I'll be on Hagman on Tuesday night. Maybe have a chance to talk a little bit about this. And let's pray and get out of here. Father, Uh, Lord, I pray uh, for this church and for those listening that you would protect us in this time, give us the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to understand what is going on and not to be driven by a spirit of fear, but to use that knowledge as motivation to share the gospel, and disciple as many people as possible in the time that we have left. I pray that you'll bless all of us this week, keep us safe, and keep us secure in the knowledge that our hope lies in the salvation offered freely by the death, burial, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.